Hello, everyone. This is Francisco Munoz Alvarez from APACO UC. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we are now on the first session, the first talk show we are presenting here on with from APACO UC community, the APAC, APACO UC talk show number one. And I know that a lot of people will love this kind of program and please, our feedback is more than welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Now, for this first show, I have the honor to have a very good friend and an excellent person, uh, idol to a lot of people here uh, from the Oracle community. And of course, that's Connor McDonald. Connor, just adding you to the stream. There we go. Welcome to this our first show with Apaco UC. And thank, thank you very you so much accepting the invitation that's okay i, I did the drum roll i think we could, we could probably skip the drum roll next time but no but uh glad to, glad to be here and good to have a chat now oh, i'll good my friend uh, i just want to let everybody know that's watching the event online that you have the live chat option in youtube in the right side of that you just can ask questions anytime to Connor, to myself, and I will try to do my best to show the questions live and also to get Connor to answer them when possible, of course, depending on his time too. And the main goal with the talk show, we have a many kind of interviews, and this is my revenge because I remember a couple, two or three years back, Connor interviewed me, now it's my turn, in one of the Oracle events. And but this is a little bit different. I was talking to Connor before we start is we have plenty of interviews asking about technologies, asking about technical things. And the main goal of this talk show is basically to know a little bit more about the Oracle personalities and, and know a little bit them as a person, uh, how they are as a normal person, because they are normal living things. They have hobbies, uh, private lives, and things like that. And that's what we are here today to know a little bit about Connor itself. Saying that, Connor, let's just get started right here, basically. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to all the user groups. Uh, they are part of APACO UC to supporting the APAC community. And I will recommend everyone to look for the user group in your area, in your country, or in your region. And please join them because I always say this for the past 14, 15 years, um, knowledge is only valuable if you share it. And that's why I always encourage uh, uh, the people to join user groups, uh, uh, present in meetups and conference from the user groups and so on. Also, oh, I'm just in the wrong screen. Apologies for that. Just get it right here. I also want to say thank you to the sponsors of APACO UC. They are were, uh, being a sponsor of all the events we are doing, the Groundbreakers, now the APAC Days. They are going to be happening the next six months with APEX APAC Days happening from the 29th to the 31st of March. Very interesting sessions, a database a conference coming in the end of May, and so on. Thank you for CloudDB, Como. That's basically the community platform where we're still building, still in beta, still in development, and will be live if all goes well by end of June, July. And Oracle, they now is part of our sponsors for Apaco UC. And as I mentioned today, we're going to be talking as our first talk show with Connor McDonald. And talk about that, basically, Connor, uh, I know you for many years. I remember the first time when I met you was in 2008 in the Perth conference from Auzog. And in that time, I, I remember go watching your session and say, oh my gosh, this guy is amazing. How he can do a, a, a 180 uh, power, uh, slides in less than 40 minutes. That's amazing. And honestly, Connor, I always took my hat for you on that. And it's funny that the most common response I get is people going, why won't that guy just shut the hell up? 
but anyway that's <laughs> that's a fault of mine the good so. thing is you keep everything so so uh, uh, the, the the audience so engaged that's amazing that's something that really talk so well about yourself but talk about that the community would love to know a little bit more about you as a person as i mentioned that's the goal of this interview saying that how was your start in it what brought you to it and how was everything started well, it's funny you should say that. It's, it's a very timely question. I was talking about this in my office hours last night as well, uh, in that yesterday was St. Patrick's Day. And um, I've still got the can here on the uh, on the table of the can of Guinness I had last night. But the reason St. Patrick's Day is actually uh, fundamental to my IT career was when I was about, I think I might have been 10, so I'm about 10 years old. It was St. Patrick's Day and my father, hence my name, Connor McDonald obviously sounds Irish. My father was born in Ireland and he basically said, when going to a, one of his friend's house for St. Patrick's Day, have some Guinness, you know, have a bit of a, a party. And we went over there and this friend said, look, I've got this little gadget that I don't really know what it does, but I know your son Connor likes tinkering with stuff. I was always into those um, electronic kits where you could plug wires together to make, you know, a radio or, or, you know, flashing lights or whatever. I think they used to call them 65 in ones or 301 lab kits. And he had this little gadget for me that he didn't really know what it was. And neither did my father. And he lobbed it my way. And unbeknown to me, it was a Sinclair ZX80, one of the very first Sinclair machines. One kilobyte of RAM these things had. And, um, and a little sort of rubberized keyboard like in the old days. If you ever go to McDonald's and buy, you know, buy a burger, you see them tapping on those rubberized keyboards. That's pretty much all I had. So you'd go home, you'd plug it into your television, the old cathode, cathode ray tube in those days. And there was no color, it was just simply you know, letters on the screen. I think it was 40 by 25 in terms of letters, one kilobyte of RAM. And I, you know, there was no Google in those days. I went down to my local library to see if I could get information about it. And you could buy, you, can, you could borrow from the library these little coding magazines that had basic programs in them to actually program your Sinclair ZX80. With one kilobyte of RAM, you don't, you don't do a lot. Uh, you did things like noughts and crosses or, or, you know, printing out your name and stuff, very little stuff. But that, that was my first sort of, you know, in, in, intro to, to computers and IT. And I was hooked, absolutely hooked. And so it was actually St. Patrick's Day that got me started back in so when I was about 10 years old. And I, I always have tremendous empathy for those people that finish high school and say, I don't really know what to do. Because I was just one of those very fortunate people that literally from 10 years old, I thought, I love tinkering with computers. So from there, it went to a Commodore VIC-20, I think 9K of RAM. I think it came with, I think it came with 6K with the 3K expansion pack. Uh, then a Commodore 64. And by that stage, I was sort of getting into high school and then eventually you know, did a computing degree and went into um, IT in a local Perth mining company, uh, which ultimately became part of uh, BHP, one of Australia's biggest companies. Mm -hmm. And so I started off as a COBOL programmer. <laughs> and um, COBOL with hierarchical databases, DL1 and the like. And it was probably ooh, maybe 10 years after that, uh, that, you know, just like the rest of the world, the world was being told that, you know, mainframes were dead, Unix was the future, client server is the next big thing. And so we got our first Oracle machine, um, I think running Oracle 6 maybe. And that's how I got involved with, um, with that, with Oracle. But it's funny how, yeah, like literally yesterday being St. Patrick's Day, the whole start of my IT career commenced from just being lucky that we went to a St. Patrick's Day party and picking up a Sinclair ZX80. So I, um, I should uh, salute my father. May he uh, rest in peace. <laughs> no, that's great. You still, you do you have any Sinclairs uh, in, in with you, you as a nostalgic uh, 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 part of your collection in home? Oh, I've got a few things. I mean, generally, it's mainly just cans of Guinness. That's what we do um, on, on St. Patrick's Day and on his birthday in September. We normally uh, we, we salute him. Um, we were talking before this call started that uh, we both have children involved in surf club. My children have since stopped. But uh, my father was an avid surf club member. Um, when he came from Ireland, he was blown away that people would just so regularly go to the beach. So he was uh, a life member at a local surf club here. So uh, when he passed away in 1999, we went and spread his ashes uh, at the at the surf club in the ocean. So um, whenever we get a chance on his birthday, we go down to the beach and we um, have a bit of a swim and and sort of have a paddle around and and 
uh, often catch up with people in the surf club because they all they all remember him. So, no, oh, that's great. No, uh, that's fantastic. Now, when uh, what was uh, in your comparing when you started uh, with your first job with IT that you mentioned and your current job right now, year 2022, what do you notice are the main big difference when in IT since you started to now? I think probably the biggest difference I notice is the con of, of the the globalization of IT and, and I'm and I'm not talking about you know oh we're using cloud and systems running all over the world that that's all just tech I'm talking about the globalization of people that use IT uh, when I started working at BHP I remember when I was writing COBOL if your COBOL program crashed you'd get a, a dump like a hex dump and it would come out I remember those old continuous print reels 130 characters wide sort of those continuous paper and you get this giant thing about this high and we would all take it around to our system programmer named Tim. Tim was this guy, had a beard down to the bottom of his chest. He'd been a system programmer for not like Tim a hundred. No, not Tim <laughs> He His name was Tim Hart. He'd been a sister, his prog for like a thousand years. And so you'd take this giant hex dump around to him and he would sort of scramble and go, ah, oh, yes, here, here, you tried to put a three digit number into a two digit variable, there's your problem. And he'd just look at the hex dump, he was a freak. but. That was that was as far as pretty much collaboration went. If you had problems or questions, you found someone else in your own IT department in your company. That was pretty much it. And then with the advent of um, email, uh, and, and in those days we were running email off a, off a mainframe, we had a, a program called Netmail, then maybe you might reach out to other departments uh, in your organization that might be in a different physical location. BHP was an Australia-wide company. so. Maybe you might send an email to someone in a different state to maybe get some assistance or something, but it was very, very rare. <coughs> and you fast forward that to today where it's totally different, where the, the, the way we prosper in IT is by collaborating with anyone and everyone. You know, like we look at things like Stack Overflow, you know, Ask Tom, for example, but, you know, any kind of, you know, any kind of information we get nowadays generally comes from a source that is outside of the companies we work in. Um, user groups are the most classic example of that. My first exposure to the user group was the Australian user group in the late 90s, but it really wasn't until I moved to the UK in 1999 that I realized just how impactful user groups could be because the UK OG was huge. You know, whereas in Oslo, we might have a meeting, even though in those days, maybe a couple of times a year, the UK user group would have several meetings every month with different specialty areas of the database. You know, the, the community was just enormous. And, and that's how people learnt and prospered with their, in my case, Oracle technology, but in any kind of sphere. You had these, you know, user groups, SQL satellites for SQL Server, et cetera. So the globalization of people in IT, I think is the thing that struck me most. Um, that That's pretty much the, the, the main change. I, I don't think the technology changes. People say, oh, you know, mainframe, client server, internet, cloud, these are all dramatic shifts. They're not really. Yeah, really, they're all just the same thing, the business of providing solutions in the best way possible to people that want to use systems. So none of that's really changed. It's more the the globalization of community that I think has, has probably left the most lasting impact on me. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, make a lot of sense and I agree completely with you. Now, if you could change one thing in your career since you uh, all these years that, uh, that you're working with technology, what is something that you regret or something that will have changed or you will keep will change absolutely nothing? I wouldn't change much, to be honest. Um, it, it's funny how I often view working in IT as like watching a reality TV show or, or traveling on a plane. And, and I'll, let me explain those metaphors. In both those cases, half the enjoyment is being rapidly critical of what you're either experiencing or seeing. And, and IT is the same. I, I know every person I know in IT loves to occasionally come home from their day at work and talk about all, all the terrible things in their job. But it's always done with a sort of a candor and almost an enjoyment. We, we love to, you know, when we get delayed on a flight, it be, you know, we love to criticize that. But the reality is it becomes some fun story that we tell our friends later on. When we're watching reality TV, we love criticizing the people on the show, like, what are these idiots doing on Survivor? But it's part of the fun of actually you know, watching the show. 
that half the fun of working in IT is coming home and saying, you know, oh, I can't believe I did this. Oh, I can't believe this person did that. Oh, you know, it's so frustrating that, you know, it took me this long to get my password reset. But half of that, half of that, you know, critique we have is often really just anecdotes to talk about the fact that we're engaged in what we do. I, I think it's funny to come home either excited or fuming about your job means you're in generally a good place. If you come home and you just basically switch off and you just couldn't give a, you know, you have no interest in it at all, whether positive or bad, they're, they're the worst kind of jobs to have. So I'm lucky in the sense that the job I have now uh, at Oracle pretty much ticks all my boxes. I get to collaborate with the community. Obviously, COVID put a bit of a knot in that, but pr primarily my job is collaborating with customers and the community. Um, and, and I get to you know generally be sort of a small part of watching customers succeed, which is always, you know, there's, there's nothing better than someone coming back to you and saying, oh, thanks for that piece of advice. As a result, this now report runs, or this screen is better, or this is now faster, or we managed to recover our database, or even something simple as this, you know, I managed to get my code to compile. All those things, you know, that basically you've, you know, you've effectively made someone else's day and, and you can't really ask for a much better job than that. That's fantastic. And just to know a little bit more about Connor McDonough itself, what are your hobbies? What, what's your passions? What do you like to do when you're not in front of a computer? Uh, it changes. It's changed a lot over the years. Currently, most of my passions involve walking my dog. Um, and now part of that is due to COVID, but also uh, a couple of years ago, obviously, I, was, I used to travel maybe a third of my work time uh, to community events around the world. COVID put a stop to that. And the last job I had I, before I joined Oracle was doing some <coughs> IT for the WA um, gambling industry, which includes horse racing and greyhound racing. And having said that, one, one of the things I realized was that often when greyhounds are finished racing, there's generally hasn't been places for them to be rehomed. And so mm -hmm. I always told myself, if, it, if there was ever a point in my life where I could get a dog, and I wasn't traveling so much, I would get a greyhound because I knew that a lot of greyhounds were being unnecessarily put down. So sitting at my left here, just off screen is Bailey, Bailey the greyhound. He's a, a rescue greyhound. I've had him for a couple of years now. So outside of work, generally what I, I used to have lots of interesting hobbies. I used to, you know, generally go out and meet friends and or I'd, I'd go jogging or swimming. Um, you know, I've done a lot of hopefully sporting things over the years, but a lot of those have gone by the wayside now because it gets spent walking that damn dog. <laughs> but no, he's he's oh, he's a, you make exercise now. It's it's a little bit of exercise. Although, funny enough, you'd think a greyhound, fastest dog in the world, or second fastest land animal behind a cheetah, you think they'd be yeah they'd be great for your own exercise and stopping you from getting you know a little bit soft around the tummy. But they run for about sixty seconds and then they lie down for twenty three hours. It's like having a giant rug in the house. So um so other other than that. But um, but but before the greyhound came along, I used to be um interested in doing a little bit of um boxing and muay thai um because my partner was a um a muay thai fighter, and that was that's probably the best way you could ever keep fit. Although it was pretty bruising, it's, not, it's definitely a young man's sport, and I'm not a young man anymore. And um and going back before that, I used to do a lot of swimming. Um, I'm not actually a big fan of swimming, but uh, myself and my partner set ourselves the goal of swimming the English Channel, and so that was back in 2014. So you did it. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was, yep. So that was, what's that, six, seven years ago now, eight years ago now? So that's going back away. But yeah, so that was always a, a, a personal goal to start at something. Most of us pick goals that we pick, we often we pick goals for the things we're good at because, you know, it makes the level of the ratio of success higher. And I knew I was a terrible swimmer. So I thought, let's pick something where I'm bad at, which is swimming, and set ourselves a big goal. So my partner, Genevieve, and I, we set ourselves a goal of, uh, getting across the English Channel in a, in a team of people. So uh, that was 2014. But it's funny, like, at the moment that finished, I was like, yeah, I'm done with swimming. <laughs> I never liked it. Still don't like it. And the One English time Channel was very cold. <laughs> exactly. How about yourself? What, what, do you, what do you do outside of work? Uh, you know, you like to uh, rescue uh, 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 dogs. I started doing that before COVID with the horses and started with one or two. Now I had around 15. Wow. Uh, raise horses and started breeding them. Now uh, uh, probably uh, it is not a good idea. It's a very expensive hobby. 
<laughs> uh, but I started doing uh, Dragon Boat. You know Dragon Boat? Oh, yeah, yeah. They also yes. like this one. I, so, yes. yeah. My wife joined a team right here, pushed me to join them too. I really enjoy. We just went to the States last weekend, and I got a third place medal in the States on the two kilometers race. That was good. Wow. Exhausting, 11 minutes, paddling like crazy. Uh, but good now is is a new hobby that we're starting, and of course, we all the kids, everything they are involved with becomes my hobby. Surf club being official from my son, hockey, grass hockey, and and all the things. But it's good, good, and of course the dogs too. Uh, they are here causing me a little bit of. Ah, oh, there uh, you go. Confuse both of them. The other one wants to say hi too, but yeah, nah, they get a little bit crazy. <coughs> and and there, <laughs> therein lies the difference between a greyhound and other dogs. If I yell for my dog to come over, he's just going to look at me and go, "Why would I bother?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not a that's a big difference. But now, um, just a short question for you. But uh, if you can say very fast, what do you what do you see yourself more, VBA or developer? Um, I know I, I should keep this short, but I will say neither, which I know sounds like a cop out, but it's it's an interesting discussion. And, and Tim Hall was talking about this on Twitter the other day. I think the day of the DBA and the developer that those labels is when it comes to database technology is, is almost dead um, in the sense that I view the way now as I, I just call them database people. Um, and mm -hmm. and you, you could uh, yeah, you could use the term database experts, database specialists, etc. But I just prefer the term database people. Because the people that thrive as DBAs are well versed in development practices, because their job is to obviously help developers as well as keep their systems running. And those developers that are most successful are well versed in DBA topics, design, configuration, et cetera. Um, a classic example, which I tweeted this the other day, people were talking about DBAs and developers and, and roles in, in companies. And I worked at a company in the UK um, just before I came home to Australia. And it was a bunch of, I was the DBA there, and there's a bunch of developers. And in the middle of this project, they literally came to me and they said, one day they said, look, you know, is there any chance you could put together a DBA course for developers that we run, that you'll run for us after hours? So we'll all stay behind after work, um, you know, for a few nights each week. And can you run a DBA course for us? And I said, why are you looking becoming DBAs? And they went, no, they went, no. We said, if we just know how the database works from an architectural perspective, we think we'll be better developers. And so after I picked myself up off the floor, <laughs> I was blown away, but it was true. Like these, these guys literally said, yep, we want to become better developers by having a more thorough understanding of how the database works. And I can tell you, after we finished that course, and this is not blowing my own trumpet, it's a, a, a testament to their ability to pick up new knowledge. They built just some stuff, amazing applications because they just knew how the database works. So. I don't think it's a DBA versus developer world anymore. I think it's just if you're a, if you're a good database person, uh, you're going to basically succeed for yourself and for your companies. That's great. Now, thank you so much, Connor. Now let's go to the next uh, question. Basically, is ask Tom. <laughs> what took you to to go to ask Tom? What uh, why ask Tom? Um. Well, here's a funny story. This, this is a funny way of, of what I'll call completing an interesting IT career circle. Uh, in 19, ooh, let me think, 2002, I think it might have been, 2002, there was a, used to be a website called DBA Zine, the magazine for DBAs. And I think it was run by BMC in those days. They had a competition where the winning, the, the, you had to write an essay about how you would do performance tuning. And the winner got a all expenses trip paid to open world that year. And part of the prize was dinner with Tom Kite and Dave Ensor, because they were the two sort of well-known Oracle specialists around the world. And I was fortunate enough to win that competition. And I was living in London. So myself and my wife, Jillian got flown uh, to San Francisco. We stayed at the W hotel and part of it was meeting Tom in person. So we had a, a dinner with Tom. Oh, my dog has come to join me. Hello, Bailey. So we had a dinner with Tom um, and, and met him face to face. I'd met him over email a few times, et cetera. But yeah, so that was 2002, I think. We had a dinner with Tom. And then fast forward how many years? 13 years. And 
I saw on Twitter that Tom Kite was uh, retiring from Oracle. And on Twitter, they said, if you're interested in a role similar to what Tom is doing, please reach out. And so I reached out to Stephen Feuerstein, who was working at Oracle. He was putting together that team. And, um, and yeah, so it's funny how I went from occasionally talking to Tom by email on the old news groups back in the late 90s to uh, blind winning a competition to have a meal with him in 2002 to regularly interacting with him at conferences between 2000 and 2015 and then taking on a role similar to what he did at Oracle uh, when I joined Oracle. So um, I, I still have occasional contact with Tom um, and his wife, Melly. we just stay in touch. But yes, that's, that's how I got involved in resurrecting Ask Tom, which had gone dormant in 2015. And I love Ask Tom because it's literally like free training. It's like, you know, basically every time a question comes in about a topic that I'm perhaps not fully familiar in, you have to go a researcher and I have the luxury of being able to reach out inside Oracle to people who might know particular topics better. So it's literally like free education. And so um, I'm a big fan of Ask Tom. I wish I could spend more time of my day on it. Um, people off yeah, the only criticism we generally get in Ask Tom is people saying, how come I can't ask a question? And that's because Chris and I have too much of a backlog uh, to get through. But um, other than that, yeah, it's um, Ask Tom's a, a joy to work on. That's fantastic. No, I was, coincidentally, I was, because all these talk shows they were going to be doing, by the way, Maria Kogan will be the next one on the talk shows in a couple of weeks from now. And I was talking with Tom last week, trying to convince him to bring him wow. out of retirement for uh, 20, 30 minutes. And I was not lucky. But he, uh, that's nice. And of course, if I start comparing things, you are the natural evolution of Oxton, Oxton from Tom to you. Basically, I can see the connection and it's something that a lot of people appreciate for sure. And are you thinking after a COVID situation is, or, or other words, life come back to normal or the new normal? Are you planning to be crazy like Tom that was one week away, one week overseas, one week away, one week overseas? No, I, d I don't think, funny enough, no matter how keen you are on meeting the community, which which I love, I, I don't get me wrong, I love the travel aspect of the job. Um, I think a week on a week off is just toxic for your health um, and, and toxic also for your, just your outlook on the world. Because as I said, a good chunk of the fun of traveling is complaining about the things that go wrong, but that enjoyment about complaining about them is when it happens every few months. If you're getting your bags lost every week, if you're getting on delayed flights every week, then yeah, the negativity can easily spiral out of control. Um, so I, I think even Tom would acknowledge that that was perhaps not a, a wise move. Um, but having said that, you know, certain communities like the Eastern States of Australia, um, which is a place I used to regularly go, India being another one, um, because Perth is probably the closest uh, place to go to India. Uh, those two communities in particular, um, I really miss being able to see face to face. And and with all due respect to the fact that you're running this platform and every other platform, Zoom, Teams, etc., I honestly think that while they are a remarkable achievement in terms of how fast that technology solution has grown over the last couple of years, I think people are just desperate to get back to face to face. I think human beings are meant to be together. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping we have an evolution back to to that model um, in the near future. Yeah, that's that's not easy. Everybody miss that kind of connection and have the contact with the people, because one thing is virtual uh, technologies, and other thing is being able to see a person, interact with others. It is a very different, and for sure, everybody miss it. I miss that like as crazy, to be honest. Yeah. All right. I just want to remind everyone that's watching the live session that you can ask questions to Connor any moment using the chat option on YouTube Live too. Now to the next part. Something funny, funny, something dramatic. Any uh, what's any funny hist uh, uh, situation or experience, Connor, that you have had uh, during your career? Uh, doing a consulting uh, job, doing a presenting or traveling, and something not that funny or kind of dramatic, the other, the opposite side. Any experience like that, that you would like to share with us? 
Okay, well, what I'll do is I'll mix and match the, the two stories in one because this was both dramatic and funny. Well, hopefully the listeners will find it funny. It was certainly uh, dramatic for me at the time. But uh, when I was working for BHP, we had a server migration. We had to move all the uh, data from one old sunbox to another. And I was doing this from Perth uh, uh, to a remote mine site called Newman, which is about 2,000 kilometers north of Perth in the Pilbara. It's uh, in the middle of the desert, basically. So on average, it's you know 45 degrees during the day, so 120-ish for those who work in Fahrenheit. And I had someone helping me. They were basically doing the various bits and pieces uh, through the, the physical part of the migration. In those days, there was no real strong networking between these machines. So you would unload the data to tape, take the tapes over to the new machine, restore from tape, and then that's how you've done your server migration. Now, on a mine site, no matter how much you try, even in computer rooms, they're dusty, they're full of dirt. There's, you know, mine sites are just dust, dust bowls. And so there's often issues with hardware reliability. And because of that, we were very, very cautious. We said, when we take a copy of the data from this machine, we're going to put it onto three copies onto tape, three tape copies, and we're going to take those three copies over to the new machine and restore. And unfortunately, and this was probably my own fault, Computer capacity in those days, you know, you would buy hard drives. They might be nine or 10 gigabytes in size and they'd be plugged in with SCSI connectors. We had to take some of the old drives over to the new machine as well for repurposing. So we put three copies on the tape, unplug the um, hard drives, put, plug some of them into the new machine and started restoring. About halfway through the restoration, the first tape fails, but you get a bad read off the tape and which is not uncommon because um, I should have said this is an iron ore mine site. So of course, not only are you surrounded with dust, you're surrounded by dust, which is full of iron, which conducts electricity, not the best thing for tapes and servers, etc. So the first tape fails and we're about halfway through the restore. Not a problem, I say, because we've got two more copies. Second tape drive goes in and we start restoring some more. That gets about 80% of the way through. And yeah, that tape fails as well. We get a corrupted read off the tape. Now the anxiety levels are starting to grow a bit because we've only got one tape left. But I have a look and pretty much the only thing we left to restore is the system table space. All the other table spaces have been restored correctly. So I'm doing all this over the phone to my friend, Frank, who was the guy up there. I said, like, okay, Frank, get the third tape out, stick it in the uh, tape machine. He sticks it in there. And next thing you know, he says, yep, tape is just spooling out of, the, uh, of this tape drive and nothing's been read. At which point I'm starting to panic because now I've got everything back except the system table space and I'm out of tapes. We have no more stuff left. So at this point, I'm thinking I'm pretty much screwed here because we've repurposed some of the drives from the old machine. So the old data is gone. We haven't managed to get it on the new machine. Uh, I'm gonna have to phone the CEO and say, we've lost your database. Uh, and this database was controlling truck movements around the mine. So. Uh, we were told that effectively, while the system was down, if the trucks couldn't get up and running, we lose about a hundred to two thousand uh, dollars every single hour. This thing was down, so a bit of a drama. I'm sitting there panicking about what to do, and just I'm doing that. The phone rings, and it's my wife, Jillian. She says, "Oh, how's the migration going?" I know you said it was going to be stressful, and I said, "Don't talk to me about it." I said, "This is a nightmare." Anyway, why are you ringing? And there's this long pause. And suddenly she bursts into tears and says, our canary has flown away. It's got out of the cage. At which point I'm going, I could not give a rat's about the damn canary. I'm about to lose my job. But no, you can't say that over the phone, obviously, to your wife who's now in tears. So I tell Frank, I say, look, I'm just going to grab a coffee. Just bear with me. And Frank's like, what do you mean you're going to get a coffee? We've got enormous dramas here. But I said, look, I'm just going to grab a coffee, jump in the car, go as hard as I can to our house. And you know, there's my wife pointing up at this tree, which is 100 feet high, saying, I think he's at the top of this tree. Can you go get him? And the whole time I'm thinking, if I get this damn canary, I'm just going to wring its little neck anyway. But I climb this tree to as high as I can, nowhere near this damn bird. I get back, but that seems to have appeased my wife that I've done that a sufficient effort. So the canary is gone. I drive back to work. But luckily, I had this brainwave that while I'm in the car and while I've been managed to distract myself from the fact that my career is about to come to an end. And I suddenly realized that 
one of the drives we haven't repurposed, the internal OS drive on this old server, probably was where the system table space was residing. Um, so we get back there, managed to find the fact that, yes, the system table space has been preciously left intact on the old box. We copy it over to the new box, and we managed to uh, get the system up and running just within our outage window. And of course, we didn't tell anyone that we'd lost all three tapes and we came within a whisker of losing everything. We simply sent that standard email saying, migration completed, no obstacles encountered, everything's fine. So I got away with it, didn't lose my job. We did lose the canary, bless his little soul. Uh, hopefully a cat ate him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's my funny and dramatic story all in one. <laughs> no, that's... That's a, a, a great story, and oof, I know the feeling of that kind of situations. Uh, they always happens. And next question for you. You a dog or cat person? Basically, you already answered that question, kind of, but what what are you, a dog or a cat person? I'm, I'm, I'll say I'm both. I, I probably have a leaning toward dogs. All through my childhood, we had dogs as children. Um, and, and it's funny you put that poster up and it's true that like, yeah, like uh, there's an old saying they say, you know, dogs have owners and cats have staff. Um, funnily enough, in terms of a con, uh, sort of a, a nice counterbalance, I have a greyhound. Uh, my partner Genevieve rescues cats. So she has uh, three cats at her house. And funnily enough, you'll think that would create some angst between the greyhound, but greyhounds being giant sooks. Uh, he's met one of the cats only once. The cat took a giant swipe at him, swatted him on the nose. And ever since then, he's been totally petrified and will not go in the same room as the cats. So it's funny, uh, people talk about large dogs like greyhounds being, you know, well, I couldn't have that around a cat. What if it eats the cat? Uh, that's the last of, our, last of our problems. Our biggest problem is getting the greyhound to come in the same room as the cats because he's terrified. Um, but yeah, so uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for cats because we rescue them. And obviously a soft spot in my heart for dogs because I rescue a greyhound. That's fantastic. All right, next, let's go to the next question. Basically, how do you see yourself in the next five or 10 years uh, of your career? That's funny, that, that sounds like those kind of questions you get on an interview. I remember years ago, <laughs> I, years ago I interviewed, I think for Fujitsu, and um, I remember the interview was going okay, and then the person said, where do you see yourself in five years? And I thought, that's such a, such an interviewer's question. So I, I remember I, I responded, I said, probably your boss. And uh, that, that didn't go down well at all, but um, we tried to make light of it. But no, for me, um, as long as I can keep enjoying my use of the technology and enjoy working with the, the tech community, um, and obviously at the moment, that's the Oracle community. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, then yeah, I, I, would, I, I enjoy that role. Um, I think for myself and everyone else, um, I think the days of being a specialist in one area are probably coming to an end. Um, I think the, the the IT world now is moving to, we want people who are, oh yes, you know Oracle, but you'll need to know some NoSQL. You'll need to know some Docker. You'll need to know some networking skills. You'll need to know Terraform, Ansible, uh, Python, machine learning, et cetera. It's funny how, and, and this is probably a, perhaps a small lament of mine is I think the era of the specialist, the person that has incredibly depth of knowledge in a particular area is, is less sought after than it used to be. Um, people are looking for people are looking for people who are, who are competent in lots and lots of areas. Now, I think that's a good thing because I think that keeps everyone's roles interesting. If you're a specialist, then I think it's easy to get um, burnt out or bored with what you're doing. So I think in general for the IT community, uh, the, the ability to spread your knowledge over lots of different areas, I think is a good thing. However, the downside of that is, is I think we, we have a bit of a, um, a landscape at the moment in IT where when things do go wrong, they go wrong huge and no one can fix them. And especially with the ever, ever increasing complexity of IT solutions, uh, when things go wrong nowadays, that you know we we have massive outages, or we have you know the the general resort is let's just restart everything, let's reboot, let's switch it off and on again, etc. The days of troubleshooting and and solving problems, um, I think, are disappearing because that that 
that uh, group of experts in particular product areas uh, seems to be disappearing. So that's that's something that I find disappointing. I I think um, there's always going to be a role for the specialists, but uh, but but yeah. Conversely, I think it's good for us as a community that we have to spread our knowledge over greater um, layers of technology. And you see yourself in five or ten years still living as a parrot boy, or you going? To, you think that maybe in the future you're thinking to change the airs or anything like that? Well, who knows? It's funny. Like I've always stayed in Perth because of my children who love Perth. Um, but they're now 15 and 17. The oldest one started driving now, and he's got that little bit more independence. I suspect they're, they're certainly, my boys are definitely getting to that age where their dad has gone from being cool to their dad as being someone they'd rather not hang around. <laughs> now, I'm hoping that's not entirely my fault and that that's just an age thing. But yeah, I, I think as they spread their wings and become more independent, then obviously that will um, free up myself in terms of if I chose to move somewhere else, I don't think it would bother them that much. Um, and, and based on that, I've always um, entertained the idea of living perhaps in the USA um, because that's where obviously a lot of the technology centers are um, or even just moving to the other side of Australia, maybe to spend some time over there. Um, I certainly right missed my yeah, time. Waiting for you in open hands here in Queensland. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, had to, I, I have a soft spot for Brisbane because similar size to Perth, you know, similar city based on a river, close to the ocean, um, beach lifestyle. So it's certainly a, a transition I could make without too much difficulty. Uh, whereas, for example, I love Melbourne. Melbourne's a, a lovely place in terms of its culture and especially like its eating and, and, and nightlife. But it's also damn cold in winter and being a Perth boy, that might be a bit of a, a struggle. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly, one of the highlights of my life was the five years I spent in the UK, um, even though I knew I would eventually come home to Perth. So uh, certainly, yeah, the ability to live in other places, I think, certainly broadens your perspective and, and generally hopefully makes you a better human being. Fantastic. All right. Now, finally, as the last session of the, the interview, the community. Is there anything else you would like to share with the APEC community that about yourself that uh, I have not asked it or and nobody have asked it by uh, the, the chat? Um, I suppose the best way I, I would like to answer this question is to say that uh, t two things. The first one is in terms of if you're a listener on this call and you're uh, a member, but not perhaps an active member of your local user group, or perhaps you're not even a member at all of your local user group, or you've never heard of user groups, etc. I can't stress enough how much you should be supporting them because um, the last two years, if you're involved in a user group, if you're a volunteer or in a paid position to user group, the last two years have been brutal for user groups. The reality is, for most user groups, the face-to-face -face events are a way of generating, a, generating enough revenue to last for the rest of the year. So they can put on various other events for their local communities. And so the last two years with COVID have absolutely done so much damage, both financial and organizational and volunteer and membership damage to user groups. And let's face it, the vast majority of people who run these user groups are doing it on a voluntary basis to make the community prosper. So the first message I would be saying is, if you are in any way associated with a user group, even as a general member, or you just know of one in your local area, try reach out to them. If they're doing an event in the next, in the, in the next 12 months, do your best to either be a speaker at them, and obviously that's a much bigger ask if you're not a speaker, but even if you're just an attendee, just making that little bit of effort to get along to your local user group meetings, is the re-energizing that they'll need to come out of this COVID nightmare that it's been for them. Because otherwise, you know, even though we're going to come out of COVID, there's going to be a whole lot of user groups that simply have, will have ceased to exist because people have sort of moved on. And I think that would be an absolute tragedy for their community to have not have the user group support that we have always had for the last, you know, two or three decades. So my first message will be, and this is, you know, this this is not being a being a me being a user group member. This is me being an Oracle person. So I'm, you know, a commercial entity. I'm saying get out there and support your local user groups. It's going to be critical for all of us to prosper. And the second reason I'll say is the reason, you know, if if you're thinking, well, fine, thanks for that message, but it's not really my cup of tea. What's in it for me? Even from a perhaps a more selfish perspective. 
I think we, you'll be able to get so much out of being in a user group. And the best example of that I can give you is perhaps my own story. I worked for BHP. I went to Europe in 1999 and I've had a few dealings with the Australian user group, but I you know, hadn't done a lot really. I'd just gone long as an attendee. When I went to the UK OU, UK OUG first event, I thought I should give this a go. I should give some speaking a go. But even before I did that, I met some people in the user group by going to the first few meetings there. Some of the people involved there said they were going to a particular training course that was going to be held. Um, that training course was held in Oxford University run by Jonathan Lewis. It turned out that in one of those training sessions, I sat next to a guy named Moans Norgard, who headed up a company called Miracle, who ran a lot of Oracle events in Europe. Through that, I got to meet a whole lot of other contacts in the Oracle community. And through that, I managed to get various roles and jobs and almost kickstart my post-Australian Oracle career. So I can literally owe maybe 10 to 15 years of independent consulting before I joined Oracle and subsequently probably the job at Oracle to the fact that I was lucky enough to be an active participant in user groups um, in the UK. So even from a selfless perspective, if you're interested in getting ahead in your IT career, support your local user group community. Um, it'll, it benefits the community, but you'll be amazed how much it benefits yourself and your own career as well. I seem to have lost Francisco. Are you there, Francisco? You, yep, can back? you hear me? I can now. <laughs> ah, okay, uh, sorry about that. Looks like I was talking to myself. Now I agree completely <laughs> that situation with the user groups that affected everyone. And it's not something easy. The user groups try to uh, evolve and try to do things like virtual events. But as you mentioned, it's not the same. And these uh, initiatives, getting involved with them, getting uh, uh, starting speaking like you, uh, you mentioned. Today, I can share with the community something that I experienced that I had uh, uh, in a project that I'm working with tomorrow. People that I met in the user group, in the community, can help me sharing their experience with another project to make me less painful to myself. And is a win-win to everyone. And especially to careers, like you mentioned, that is a jumpy start, fantastic to many people, help you to uh, uh, increase your networking and get access to people, companies. It, it, it's fantastic. And it's a fantastic advice. And I will say one more thing in terms of putting my Oracle hat on for a second. Um, this is a great two-way thing. If you go to Oracle user group communities and Oracle people are there, rest assured, the biggest challenge we have inside Oracle is getting regular access to customers so we know what works really well for them and what doesn't. So even if we go to a user group meeting, if you come up to the Oracle person and it's me and you go, this piece of your product sucks, that's a win for us and a win for you because it's probably feedback we were unaware of. That the toughest part about being in such a company as large as Oracle is knowing what, how customers are using and actually experiencing our products. So, you know, even if you are really frustrated with a particular element of the Oracle technology, being in a user group and feeding that back to Oracle people helps us and ultimately helps everyone prosper by helps us make improvements to the product. So, yeah, even if you are frustrated with technology, come along to your user group and share that frustration with us because it'll help us make a better product for you. Thank you so much, Connor. Thank you so much for taking the time for this interview to open yourself about the Connor, the man or the person behind the famous the uh, Connor McDonald in the Oracle world. And it, it's great to know a lot uh, more about yourself. Thank you very much Thanks for having sure. me, Francisco. It's, it's been a pleasure. Now, thank you so much. And I hope you, uh, uh, you take care, all the best to yourself and your family. Likewise, to everyone listening to us. Uh, again, I will mention that your next uh, uh, guest for the next session in a couple of weeks will be Maria Kogan. And on that session, I will announce the next one because every two weeks we are going to have an interview that will allow us to know a little bit more about uh, our Oracle celebrity around the world. And Connor, uh, thanks again. And I hope you'll, all this is over. We can see each other very soon. I hope so. Thanks, Francisco. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.